Data re-engineering is perhaps the most foundational step for your ERP selection as well as ERP implementation because that drives your processes and in turn that drives your system as well as system architecture. So what are the top 10 ERP data re-engineering candidates leading to ERP implementation failure in 2023? That's what we are going to discuss. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Gupta. I am principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. We help our clients with ERP strategy, ERP selection, as well as ERP implementation. On that note, let's go back to today's topic, which is going to be top 10 ERP data re-engineering candidates leading to ERP implementation failure in 2023. Most times when companies look at the ERP selection, even the professional ERP selection consulting firms, they are only going to look at the process view just because they might not have as much implementation expertise. But typically the data itself is going to be a huge problem. If you are going to keep your data as is in your new system, most likely you are going to have issues regardless of the advancement in technology or regardless of how usable the new system is. So that's why these candidates are typically the drivers why ERP implementation fail. So now let's look at the list. Number 10 on our list is the work orders or projects. And these are one of the most common data re-engineering candidates in several ERP implementation. And the reason for that is because legacy systems, the way they were designed, they did not have as much processing capacity of business objects. They could not handle the long-standing business objects. Uh, if you are looking at any sort of jobs, uh, typically the way they handled this is they had to segment each of the work orders or the projects in separate steps. At that time, since it was not possible to process them in one go, that's why they had to do this. But a lot of companies consider this as their processes or the requirements, and they are going to feel that that's how their business and data is structured, and they are going to be looking for the systems that can handle them as is. Typically, when you have this issue, it drives admin effort for you because you need to combine all of these steps in uh, one instance to be able to analyze your cost, to be able to schedule. Sometimes you might require sequencing and sequencing is just a symptom of the broken process. It's not necessarily the need that you have, but you are still going to feel that that's your need. So work orders and projects are one area that you should be paying attention to. You have to align the your existing information model with the data model of the new ERP before you start your implementation. So that's number 10. Number nine area that we have is the inventory allocation. And inventory allocation is very interesting as well. For the most part, most companies are going to be requiring the some sort of allocation functionality. The legacy systems, the way they were designed, and even today, when you look at these smaller systems, they are not going to have as robust allocation functionality. Sometimes they might simply pretend to have allocation functionality. They are going to need a lot of ad hoc arrangements to be able to facilitate the allocation process and this is not going to be just inside the ERP. Sometimes when you are going to be using multiple ERP systems, WMS, TMS systems, and you are transferring the state of allocation, because let's say if you're reserving the inventory for a specific customer, that needs to be reserved in all of the systems. And sometimes WMS may have the allocation algorithm or the algorithm that WMS may have, it might not be aligned with your ERP. So you are going to have a lot of issues as well as patchy experience overall in allocating inventory. 
So whatever ad hoc arrangements that you had made in your old system, if you don't re-engineer your data aligned with the new system, new architecture, you are going to find a lot of issues and then you are going to go back to those ad hoc arrangements, manual reconciliation, GL entries. So you are not going to get the benefits that you are hoping to get in the new system. So that's number nine. Number eight on our list is the ECN workflows. And for the most part, when you look at the companies, they are going to feel that they might not have the need for a sophisticated ECN process. The reason for that is because I don't have as formal products. So how do I incorporate ECN process in my workflows? And because of that, you are going to have a lot of issues. The issues are going to be in how you are going to be transferring your BAM from your uh, engineering to your production. And let's say if the engineering wants that production crew should not be touching some of the sub-assemblies or you want those sub-assemblies to be sourced from the inventory, sometimes that could be the symptom of the ECN process just because your broken ECN process might be driving these things and you might feel that you know what i am going to do customization in the system to be able to accommodate these needs but the root cause for this was your broken ecn process just because you didn't have that that's why you might be getting all of these issues so looking at the ecn process regardless of whether you are going to be a formal product optimization or not is super critical and that is one of the areas for data re-engineering in uh, 2023 and that's number eight. Number seven on our list is the bombs and revision number. Some of the common issues that we see with the bombs and revision number is going to be revision numbers uh, not utilized and you are going to you are going to have a lot of duplication and when you are going to have duplication meaning the two revisions that you are going to have with respect to your bombs they might not be connected with each other they might have the substantial duplication among them. They might not have the common model that they might be utilizing overall from the metadata perspective. And because of that, you are going to have a lot of issues because these are two different instances. So the costing is going to be different. It's going to have issues with respect to your planning. You are going to have a lot of maintenance issues with that. Then you might have the separate excuse for revision. It is very similar issue. Just like if you are not going to be using revision in the case when revision is not going to be utilized, meaning you are not utilizing any revision. You are creating a new SKU for each of the revision. The return implemented as a routing step, that's also a very common issue that we typically notice uh, with a lot of companies in that you are consuming the cost of your return as part of your product as well as BOM. So your insight is going to be all over the place. So sometimes that could be implemented just because your existing system did not have a formal return process. That's why you may have implemented that. Some of the other issues are going to be mixing up different hours and that typically limits the traceability that you are going to get in the system. Mixing of hours is going to be, let's say you didn't segment your run hours from your setup hours or queue hours. All of these issues can lead to the insights that might not be meaningful for you. So that's why mixing off hours and how they are structured, whether they are really aligned with your physical processes is super critical. So that's number seven. Now, number six on our list is a chart of accounts. The most common issues that we typically notice with chart of accounts is they are going to be too verbose. And the reason why they might be too verbose is because the existing system may not have a support for sub account. And that's why, let's say if you are capturing all of your fixed asset, you captured as the individual chart of account. So now you have maybe 6,000 chart of accounts. The challenge in tracking them individually is going to be that they are not going to be connected. They are going to require a lot more maintenance and the traceability is going to be super difficult as well. So the new system may have support for dimensions, sub accounts. You might not require them to be too verbose to be able to get the same insight that you were not able to get with systems like QuickBooks. So that's very common. Also, the chart of accounts when uh, you have not utilized the way the ERP model is designed, you are going to have scalability issues, maintenance issues. So make sure you align that with the ERP data model. That's number six.
Number five on our list is the customer master. And we see a lot of different issues with the customer master. The reason why the customer master becomes a huge issue because as soon as you are going to release the implementation to your users, if you don't have the formal master data governance process or how they are going to be creating the customers, typically they are going to create whatever they feel is right. Sometimes you might have issues where you are creating duplicate customers using, let's say if you have customer as your 3M and you could have 3M and 3M Inc. From their perspective, they are not doing anything wrong as such, but these are going to be two different instances from the system perspective. So you want to make sure that you have the formal master data governance process and you coach them in terms of what is going to be the guideline so that everything is going to be centralized overall from the customer master perspective. The other issues that we see with the customer master, sometimes the alignment is not going to be okay. What is shipped to? What is built to? How do you capture for each of the customers and whether uh, you, know, you need to uh, capture them as more of the parent account versus your ship to? Sometimes you are going to have buying groups, but you might capture them as individual customers. So your insights are not going to be connected. You are going to have issues with your billing, etc. So that's why the customer master is uh, the area that is super critical for the data re-engineering. And if you don't fix that, if you're simply going to implement that as is, you are going to have a lot of issues. And that's number five. <music> Number four on our list is the sub accounts and sub accounts could be a problem as well. Sub accounts typically require far deeper understanding of the ERP processes. If you are going to include unnecessary sub accounts that may require input with every single transaction as well as document that you are going to capture in your ERP document that is going to add one click. We see this issue with a lot of different companies where they did not understand the role of sub accounts. Yes. In some cases, you need to have sub accounts when you are looking for the dimensional traceability across your processes. Sometimes they simplify the processes, but if you are going to overuse them, you might struggle with that. And typically, whatever you can do with sub accounts, you can do by other means as well. You need to identify the right candidates, how you are going to be capturing them. And typically, this is going to be driven by your legacy implementation, how that was configured and modeled. That could drive a lot of process complexity. So make sure you pay attention to sub accounts, the way they are captured. And if there is any re-engineering that needs to be done with respect to sub account, you should do that before implementing your new ERP. So that's number four. <music> Number three on our list is the serial and lot numbers. And with serial and lot numbers, you are going to find a lot of issues if your legacy system did not support the serial number, the way your serial numbers were captured. Sometimes we see issues such as either some sort of, you know, production days, project number, or some random number is being used as the serial number. It's not generated by your ERP. So you might have a lot of issues with that. Sometimes we see issues such as your serial number or lot number getting mixed or lot number not implemented appropriately. All of these issues can lead to substantial process as well as system architecture issues. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to how serial numbers are imp implemented and they need to be aligned with the scheme of the new system. The issues that you are going to find with the serial number and the lot numbers is going to be Traceability issues with the serial number and lot numbers, other processes over bloated to cover the inefficiencies of the process. The solution that you have is use the serial numbers provided by the system. Don't hijack the workflows to hijack the numbering scheme. If the serial number workflow too difficult, don't implement it. Sometimes companies, what they do is they are going to feel that, you know what, this system was not really designed for my workflow. For example, let's say if you got an ERP that was really designed for bigger products such as car, and they are going to have multi-step in their process, and that is probably going to over bloat your processes. So obviously you did not, did not buy the right system or which did not support this particular process, or you may have implemented it incorrectly. And because of that, you have a lot of issues now with the serial number and lot processes. So, you know, and if you are going to implement this as is in the new system, you are still going to have all of those issues. You have to over customize your new system. So that's number three. <music> Number two on our list is the unit of measure and unit of measure is one of the biggest issue in general, uh, you know, with the ERP implementation. 
just because the V unit of measure may have been implemented, they might not be aligned with the new model. Sometimes you may not have incorporated them because that required a lot of effort overall from the data perspective. And you simply felt that it's not going to be a big issue and you simply implemented them. And now you are having issues with your sales process, production process, procurement process. So the most common issues that we generally see with respect to unit of measure is they don't mimic the natural hierarchy of data, that natural hierarchy in how you are buying, how you are consuming, how you are selling is super critical. Uh, sometimes unit of measures are companies may have modeled them as the drop down options or form field just because they did not understand how unit of measures work in the ERP system. And then you are going to have a lot of issues. Sometimes they might capture them as individual SKUs. That is going to be another issue that you are going to face. And then the risks that you are going to find is um, you are going to have a lot of different MRP issues if you don't capture them appropriately. So that's number two. Now, number one on our list is the SKU numbers. SKU numbers, it's very similar to bombs, the way your SKU numbers may be driven. Sometimes you are going to have intelligent SKU numbers. You might be incorporating a lot of different intelligence as part of your SKU numbers or descriptions, and that might be driving the admin effort. If you don't fix that, then you are going to have a lot of issues in the new system as well. So that's why the data re-engineering, even for SKUs, is going to be super critical. Now, you might not be able to change all of your SKUs just because you may have given this to your customer. So you need to figure out a rollout strategy, the migration strategy in terms of how you are going to be retiring all of these legacy SKUs and how you are going to be implementing the new SKUs. Because if you keep the old ones, you are never going to get the insights that you really need or the planning that you are hoping to get from the new system. So you might not be able to change everything right away. And that's why this is super complicated overall when you look at these data re-engineering issues, because you can't start everything from clean slate. And that becomes a big problem because you are still going to keep some of these re-engineering candidates as is, and that is going to drive the process complexity, the system complexity. So they go hand in hand overall when you look at the data process as well as system. So even if you are going to keep them, you need to have the rollout plan in how you are going to be retiring them, what impact that is going to have on the process, what impact that is going to have on your system architecture. If you have multiple systems involved, this issue could be even bigger because the bloatedness that you have with respect to your SKUs, if that is going to be only in one system, your integration is not going to work. It's going to require a lot more admin effort in reconciling your data. So all of these issues could lead to the implementation failure, even if you have the fanciest technology out there. So that's why looking into the SKU numbers, realigning them before implementing your ERP is super critical. So that's number one. If you enjoyed this video, we also have this podcast available in the audio format on Google, Spotify, and Apple. So you might want to check that and subscribe if you are interested. We publish these videos on a weekly basis. So if you have not hit the subscribe button, you might want to do that. Also, we are going to include an in-depth article that is going to have far deeper analysis for this topic. So check that out. And if you have not checked our digital transformation report for 2023, we are going to include the link on that note. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.